Let's pray together, please. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can call you Father and that your scripture is alive and you would encourage us and challenge us through it. And that's my prayer right now through Christ. Amen. According to Tim Massey in Greene County, Tennessee, the old timers would often sit around and talk about the old times. And when somebody would say something about how cold this past winter was, like I guess in the 1970s, there was a winter that was negative 20 degrees. They would say, yeah, that's nothing like the winter of 1864, the coldest winter in Greene County record. Sometimes that year were so cold, they said, you could not ride a horse because the ice in the ground was so sharp that horses would, if they were, would, would step on it, they would, it would cut their, uh, cut their, their, their feet and they would end up having to destroy the horse. Well, of course, 1864 in Greene County, Tennessee was Civil War times. Union troops were housed there in Greene County in the Greenville area, and desperately they looked for any kind of provision to keep them warm. They had worn clothes with them from the summer, the lighter jackets. They had not worn, uh, brought winter coats, and so it was not just unbearable but in the in the sub you know 30 degree weather, but the fact that they were poorly provisioned as well. According to one account, I'm not sure if this is true or not, was recorded as true, some union, armor, some union officers went to a local farmer there in Greenville asking permission if they could burn some of, the, some of his rail fence. Reluctantly, he agreed. Obviously, you're, he probably would have been thankful if they just asked permission. But he told them that he could, they could only burn the top rail. Yep, they could use his fence for heat if they would only use the top rail, of course. Now, each watch of the night, soldiers would take the top rail and burn it for warmth. And then another watch would come on and then another. By morning, the entire fence had been eliminated completely destroyed. Sadly, without the fence, the farmer's cattle had no boundaries to stay within. The, the cattle wandered off uh, into dangerous places where most were lost. And the farmer's, um, the, the farmer's income destroyed. Isn't that a great image? Isn't that the nature of moral compromise? We rationalize we're just going to compromise a little bit. It's just the top rail that we will compromise. But one compromise leads to another. And, and you just keep taking off the top rail until the entire boundary is destroyed. And then you look back 10 years later only to discover that those little compromises have led to complete change. When my parents were growing up, for instance, in the United States, the sex outside marriage was ostracized. It was scandalous. People still conducted themselves impurely, but the standard was clear. Gradually, though, sex outside marriage became uh, less stigmatized. Today, we've come to the place that all the rails have been removed, so much so that if a minister says to a couple that is engaged in sex outside marriage that they need to stop, that they need to be sexually pure until marriage, it is not unusual for the couple to balk, to think, man, that preacher is just old-fashioned. And who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you to judge me? The fence was eliminated, but just one rail at a time. And now, 50 years, 70 years later, the fence is gone. 
That's why Proverbs 22, verse 8 says, don't move an ancient boundary marker that your ancestors set up. Instead, be humble. Not all progress is progress. Yes, tearing down the fences will give you freedom from those fences. Well, I do what you want for a certain period of time, but a world without fences is not a free world. The prophet Jeremiah tried to make the same point using a different metaphor in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, when he said, this is what the Lord says. Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths. Which is the way to what is good? Then take it and find rest for yourself. But, Jeremiah said, they protested. God's people protested. We won't. Jeremiah continues. I appointed a watchman over you and said, actually, it's the Lord speaking through Jeremiah, appointed a watchman and and said, listen for the sound of the ram's horn. But they protested. We won't listen. Therefore, listen, you nations and you witnesses, learn what the charge is against them. Listen, earth, I am about to bring disaster on these people, the fruit of their own plotting, for they have paid no attention to my words. They have rejected my instruction. Jeremiah's image there is of a traveler who's lost his way. And the traveler finally realizes he's lost. And so he stops and he asks for direction. Which is the good road? I was once on a good road. Can you lead me back, direct me back to the good road while there's still time? And God says to them, yes, stop. Look to the ancient paths. Go to back, go to the place that you came from, the standards that I originally gave you. Rebuild, in a sense, the fences that I set up for you. But the people said, no, we don't want your roads. We don't want to return. We don't want to repent. We want to go forward. By the way, this is common sense. From the beginning of time, God has instructed and warned people on how to live. The first instruction in the garden was essentially, obey me and you will live. Disobey me and death will come upon you. Moses would stand before the people later on after giving the the law. And he says, God is showing you today two ways. One way will lead to life. Obedience leads to life. Another way will lead to death. Disobedience leads to death. And Moses would say very clearly, without... um, Without any hesitation or ambivalence, he would say, choose life that you may live, that your children may live. It's Psalm 23. He leads us down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. From ancient times, God has been marking out the way of salvation and the way of destruction. Jesus talked about the narrow path that leads the life to life, the broad path that leads to death. But as time passes, people get away from God's right paths. Sometimes we move away from God's paths because of ignorance. Maybe we just don't know better for some reason. Sometimes we move away in deliberate defiance. We just don't like God's ways. Our generation has strayed because we've listened to our hearts, influenced by a world and a culture that has said the way to find life is to follow your own heart. You know, people will say this even to their children about getting, about giving their life to Christ. How will I know when to give my life to Christ? I want to give my life to Christ. How will I know? Oh, your heart will tell you. Really? I know what they mean by that and their intentions by that. But then how do I know what's right and wrong? Well, your heart will tell you. How I know it's love? Well, your heart will tell you. How I know that it's good? Well, your heart will tell you. If it feels good, it must be God's way. And so people then start to feel ways that God says is sin. People start to feel identities or desires that God says is the way to destruction. And people say, well, why would God make me feel this way if I wasn't supposed to feel these feelings and to follow these feelings and we live in a world that is absolutely confused and God would say go to the ancient paths how does the change take place not all of a sudden it's not it, it, people don't suddenly become base 
It's just one rail at a time until the whole fence is gone. Oswald Chambers wrote in my utmost for his highest. Initially, we trust our ignorance, calling it innocence. And next, we trust our innocence, calling it purity. Isn't that good? Let me read that again. Initially, we trust our ignorance, follow your heart. And we call it innocence because your hearts know what's right, knows what's right. Next, we trust our innocence. Your heart must know what's right, calling it purity. The heart is pure, must be pure. Then when we hear these strong words from our Lord, we shrink back. And what are the strong words from the Lord? God's words saying, the heart is deceptive above all things. The heart is not innocent. But we hear those words from the Lord and we shrink back and say, but I never felt any of those awful things in my heart. And we resent what he reveals. He goes on. Either Jesus Christ is the supreme authority on the human heart or he is not worth paying any attention to. Am I prepared to trust the penetration of God's word into my heart or would I prefer to trust my own Innocence, innocent ignorance. From the beginning of time, God has been showing us the ancient paths, the wise paths that our hearts stray from. To use the first metaphor, God establishes right fences that show us the boundaries of right and wrong, good and evil, love and not love. Living within those fences, we find freedom because where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. God reveals those fences to us through his word. But over time, it is human nature to tear down the fences for pragmatic reasons. We just want to stay warm one rail at a time. We follow our heart, even though the Bible says the heart is deceptive. We follow the crowd, even though the crowd is the, is the group that would cry out to Jesus, crucify him. As a result, our lives turn to chaos. The world becomes chaotic and God's blessing is removed. A progressive age, my friends, is an arrogant age. It assumes that we are superior simply because we lived after previous generations. But pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. What does it mean to hear God's voice calling you today? Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient paths. Which is the way to what is good? Then take it and find rest for yourselves. That is a call to repentance. That is a call to repent from our progressive arrogance that assumes the best path is the path ahead because we're superior to those who've made mistakes in the past. Will you stand by the roads and look and return to the ancient paths? Don't expect the world to. The Bible says, Jeremiah says, they protest and say, we won't. Don't expect a rebellious heart to want to. The rebellious heart is deceptive above all things. To return to the original story, of stare, instead of tearing down the fences, what, it would, what does it look like for us to rebuild them? Leviticus 11.44, God says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy because I am holy. Be separate, be different, be holy. 1 Peter 1.15 says, But as the one who called you is holy, so you are to be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Am holy. Do you have any standards in your life, any fences in your life that people in the world would tear down because they think they're unnecessary? Because they think you're too committed to purity? I think one measure that we are committed to God's purity is that those who aren't committed to holiness say no. 
they look at our lives and say, no, I won't do that. Those who don't want to follow, on the, follow God's path of righteousness would say, I don't recognize that. That's just one measure. Is there any area of your life right now where you are, when, when you're so much like Christ, your, 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 your fences are so strong for Christ that people in the world see that you are distinct, not holier than thou, but holy like Christ. How would you finish the sentence, I will? What fences have you started to tear down? 70 years ago, holy people would look at your life and your fences today and say, I can't believe that you don't have fences there. I can't believe that you go along with those standards of morale. I can't believe that you accept that kind of behavior and attitude. What does it mean for you to abandon the modern paths of compromise and recommit to ancient paths of holiness? Because the Lord says, stand by the roadways and look, ask for the ancient paths, which is the way to what is good. Then take it and find rest for yourself. Don't be like the others who protest. We won't. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would convict us not out of a sense of legalism, not because being holy is going to make us worthy of salvation, but because you are holy and we want to honor you with our lives. We don't want to be conformed to the patterns of this world, the thinking of this world, the lifestyle of this world, the acceptance of evil of this world, but we want to love as you loved and therefore we want to hate what you hate and we want to have have your standards to be our standards. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks. I hope that was helpful for you today.